Well, good morning, everyone. My name is Barkley Blair, and I'm the founder and executive director of the Information Governance Initiative, and I'll be your host uh, for our live discussion this morning. It's just past the top of the hour, so we'll get started, and uh, some other folks are still joining us. We'll give them a few minutes as we sort of go through our introductory uh, material. Sorry about that. All right, well, we've had a, uh, an interesting morning uh, here. Those of you who have uh, perhaps uh, uh, watched the news this morning or uh, picked up a newspaper, you'll see that uh, email management and retention at the federal government is uh, very much the top of the news cycle today. We'll talk a little bit about that today, and uh, at least one of us, and we'll tell you who that is, has been on the national news this morning talking about that. So the, the timing could not be better uh, for our webinar this morning. So uh, just a couple of housekeeping issues. The webinar is being recorded. It will be available uh, within an hour or two after we finish the live discussion. Uh, so look for that. Uh, what we're talking about today is actually uh, based on a white paper that we uh, developed on Capstone which will also be available shortly after the webinar. Look for it. everyone who registered to attend the webinar will get an email with a link to download uh, that white paper. So don't worry about taking copious notes because most of the details that we'll talk about today uh, will actually be covered uh, in that white paper. If you have questions uh, that you would like us to address uh, today during the, during the discussion, uh, open up that panel on the, the side of your screen and uh, ask away. We'll handle the questions and answers as we go through the webinar itself. So welcome, let's get started. Um, what I wanted to start off with uh, today was just to introduce our panelists and our, and our guest speakers today. We've got a great lineup, I think, that covers this issue about federal record keeping uh, around email and the capstone strategy and what we can learn from that not only for agencies that are seeking to implement it which we'll talk about but we'll also talk about what we can learn from capstone uh, for all kinds of organizations who of course share uh, similar difficulties in actually dealing with email from a management perspective so we've got a great uh, group of, of guests this morning to take us through that topic and I'll just let them quickly introduce themselves. Let's start with you, Jason. Why don't you uh, tell us who you are? Uh, thanks, Barkley. Uh, I am a lawyer now with Trinker Biddle and co-chair of the Information Governance Initiative. I had the good fortune of spending um, 13 years as uh, NARA's first director of litigation. Excellent. Thanks, Jason. And Carol, tell us about yourself. Thanks, Barkley. Um, I have 30 years as a federal employee, contractor, and consultant, uh, most recently with the Government Accountability Office as Director of Information Assets. Currently, I am consulting with the um, IQ Business Group, and my primary client is Department of Interior. Excellent. Well, thanks for joining us, Carol, and we'll look forward to hearing more about what you're up to at the Department of the Interior. We also have with us uh, Mark Mandel. Mark, why don't you tell us about uh, who you are? Uh, hi, I'm Mark Mandel. I'm a records management solution architect with OpenText. Um, I've been in this business since 1978. Uh, it was a lot of uh, vertical markets, uh, both on the vendor side and the customer side. Uh, prior to joining OpenText, I was the chief records officer for Washington, D.C. under Mayor Fetty. So has anything changed since 1978, or are we still dealing <laughs> with the same problems? <laughs> uh, they are different. We didn't have email back then. <laughs> right. <laughs> All right. Well, we'll talk more about more that later. Right. <laughs> Greg, why don't you tell us uh, about yourself? Uh, thanks, Barkley. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Greg Clark. I'm Director of Program Management and Product Marketing here at OpenText, uh, responsible for uh, ECM. Uh, but I've been in the information governance uh, archiving e-discovery space for the last 15 years, so uh, happy to uh, provide some guidance on our 
uh, approaches from a private sector perspective. Mark is well versed on on the uh, on the public sector, so I'll let him uh, I'll let him speak to those. But I can at least comment on on the private sector pieces. Excellent, sounds good. Well, I think today we've you know amongst the the group of uh, speakers that we have today, we, we've got this issue very well covered. Uh, Jason was actually one of the developers or the primary architect. I would say he's very humble about about this of uh, NARA's uh, capstone strategy. So obviously well qualified to talk about that from a perspective of what it's designed to do and, and, uh, and, and what the intention was behind it. And Carol is, is actually implementing it at a very large agency uh, and has some, some real hands-on experience in, in doing that, which we'll hear about. And, and Mark and Greg, of course, have technology that's essential to enabling us to actually take care of this email problem. So we'll cover it from all uh, angles today. Now, as I mentioned this morning, uh, or, or just a few minutes ago, uh, Jason, who is on our on our uh, panel today, uh, has been all over the news this morning because a story uh, has come out about Hillary Clinton uh, using her personal Gmail account during the four years that she was Secretary of State. Uh, this is an issue which uh, would seem to be pretty much Dead on covered by the capstone strategy, which you'll you'll hear about uh, as we as we talk today. But um, if, if this is if this issue could not be more on point uh, for our discussion today about you know what is the challenge of capturing and retaining and managing email of senior executives, whether you're in the public or in the private sector. So uh, before we, we talk about that, we'll, we'll have a chance to um, discuss it as we go through. Why don't we first of all just kind of step back and talk about where we're at in terms of email in general. I think a lot of times uh, as we kind of, uh, you know, more contemporary uh, modes of communication through social media and, and enterprise 2.0 and collaboration software, and texting and all the other ways that we have to communicate have come into the enterprise, there's been this idea that, well, email is going away or perhaps email is becoming less critical to how, um, how we communicate. So I'll just throw that out to all the panelists. What, what do you see happening fr from your perspective with email right now? Is it our organizations, are they on top of it? Is it uh, have we got this problem solved? Any thoughts on that? Jason, what's your thoughts on that? Well, uh, we can see from today's events that the email problem has not been solved at all. Um, we have been living with email communication since the late 1980s and early 1990s, especially in the, the federal government and, and elsewhere in the world. And um, with network systems after 1995, it has become ubiquitous as a means of communication. And yet, we have been struggling both in the public sector and the private sector to sort of get our arms around the email problem. It's only grown in volume. We all get hundreds of emails a day and the management of that is vexing. Um, we all feel overwhelmed um, both in our professional lives and our personal lives. And so agencies have uh, traditionally treated email as, uh, as something uh, that uh, might be uh, record material uh, in the federal government and um, accordingly in the early days uh, there were print-to-paper strategies and that mm -hmm. was what the default uh, was all about. However, uh, in more recent times uh, there have been a movement towards electronic record keeping and we can talk about uh, the different strategies involved in that. So it is, But it is clearly still a very vexing problem across the government and that's why this discussion of capstone is so timely. Right. Well, um, Greg, from your perspective, when you look uh, across the market uh, that you see as a supplier of technology to help go uh, after this problem, what do you see in terms of the level of maturity out there in, in dealing with email? Or, or you know, we, we talked earlier uh, when we were preparing for this discussion about some of the early approaches that organizations have tried and uh, where they've gone with that. What, what do you see with your customers? 
Well, I think the one thing just to add to you know what 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 Jason said as well, right? I think what organizations are are really striving towards is, I mean, they take on the, the burden of the cost and the risk of of email growth, right? But but there's also the the, the factor around the ability to extract value from that email from an end user perspective. We we talk about this being the age of the consumer. I think in our business it's really the age of the end user, right? Because if you can optimize productivity of those end users, you really start driving top line revenue growth because you're making your business more efficient. Right? I think at the end of the day, that is where a lot of our customers are seeing the value of an information governance practice mm -hmm. of, of, of email management as, as, as a whole. Um, we all remember the days of 250 meg, meg mailboxes, right, and, and the quotas that were, uh, you, you know, put on by, by IT, and it really in, impacted that productivity, right? At the end of the day, uh, restrictive policies led to people going rogue and creating PSTs and having aggressive delete uh, strategies because they needed to send that that uh, two meg uh, PowerPoint presentation, right? So they were t end users were taking on risky behavior. Right? Do you still so, see, Greg? Do you still see your cus customers that use this approach out in the market? Um, in terms of of having aggressive retention strategies, yeah, or, or just mailbox size limitations, or in general, not as not as much as in yeah. the past, right? I mean, yeah. you, you've got. You know, two two gig mailboxes now. Uh, you know, in terms of on-premise exchange, if you go to Office 365, you know it, it's trending towards almost limitless lim limitless mailboxes, right? So mm -hmm. that I think is um, at least if putting email at the fingertips of users is important, but it really doesn't solve a lot of the you know the governance challenges around that email and and, mm -hmm. and applying policy to, mm -hmm. uh, to mm -hmm. email as a whole. What about, um, uh, so Jason, if you think about your client base, uh, and, you know, I think we started, a lot of organizations started off with this mailbox size quota, as Greg says, it's becoming kind of an, you know, an, an uh, anachronistic approach given the, you know, seemingly infinite storage that we have. But there does seem to be, I think in organizations that I see, still this desire to, to, to have blanket 30, 60, or 90 day deletion strategies for email. Is that something that you still see out there, Jason? We do see it uh, uh, in certain pockets of places, in certain verticals. Uh, it is uh, difficult to uh, justify uh, in many regulated sectors where there are uh, requirements in place under statutes and regulations and compliance requirements that uh, expect that email and other forms of communications will be preserved for longer periods of time. So it's a uh, somewhat uh, risky strategy. Certainly in the government, um, we know that there are uh, large amounts of email that are, in fact, transitory or ephemeral and can be deleted relatively quickly. But there are um, uh, a significant amount of email that uh, constitutes longer term records under record schedules that exist. And so that is, uh, uh, it's problematic to adopt a kind of janitor sweep out function for all of email. Uh, and uh, as the slide points out, uh, there is this problem of intensive manual classification. I have been on a soapbox for a number of years, as you know, Barclay, uh, that uh, to rail against the idea that um, uh, people need to be um, uh, tagging objects and um, individually accounting for every email that might uh, be uh, sent from a mailbox. Mm -hmm. uh, it is uh, difficult to imagine very, very busy people doing that. And uh, quite candidly, uh, uh, people will seek workarounds um, one of which has made the news uh, today. One workaround is to use a private email network rather than being required to uh, tag every object uh, or, uh, or you know, spend lots of time on, on a system that uh, doesn't work right. So there are lots of problems still in the world with respect to email, and um, that's why our discussion of Capstone is important because it represents a 
a new strategy that really hasn't been widely uh, adopted in, in government before. Right. Well, let's you know talking about let's talk about the the strategy that um, you know you helped develop for the federal government called Capstone. Before we do, let's just uh, talk a little bit more about this concept of deletion because it is it does seem to be at the center of the discussion about email management, certainly in the federal sector, um, but uh, elsewhere as well in the context of litigation. This idea that uh, folks are, you know, playing hide the ball or whatever with email evidence is is certainly out there. This caught my eye the other day that, you know, when is a, a deleted email actually deleted? Um, and you know, uh, Microsoft had announced that, you know, now very helpfully instead of email just sitting in your deleted items folder, it can actually stay there forever if you like it to. So, uh, is that email actually? Is that is that actually? Uh, confounding the whole idea of email deletion. And this also caught my eye earlier in the year, which is a uh, screenshot of uh, the email inbox of the general counsel of Sony that was released uh, through the Sony hack, showing that uh, she had 4,296 items in her deleted items folder, uh, perhaps as a result of that infinite deleted items uh, capability that she had in her email account. So this this issue of email hygiene and making sure that we're keeping the things that we want to keep and getting rid of the things that we don't uh, seems to be a, an ongoing challenge and a lot of confusion around um, exactly uh, how we're supposed to tackle this. So let's turn our attention to Capstone. So Capstone, for those of you who aren't familiar, was a it is an approach uh, designed by the National Archives and Records Administration to help the federal government tackle um, the email problem. So, Jason, can you just tell us about your thinking in, in designing Capstone and, and the problem that it was designed to, to solve and, and, and how it goes about doing that? Well, sure. I, I come from the perspective of wearing a lawyer hat uh, during my time in government, as well as trying to solve problems um, for agencies um, implementing uh, uh, reasonable policies uh, in this area. From the e-discovery perspective, is uh, uh, those of us who are lawyers uh, and we're asking for documents uh, of institutions, well, um, we want to make sure that we get all responsive documents. And if you have a uh, policy in place that requires individuals to do a lot of effort for email, either printing it out or dragging and dropping, um, uh, it is uh, it is a, uh, a potential uh, problematic issue uh, to actually um, find all the relevant stuff that is part of a request. That's not only any discovery problem; it's a congressional request or a FOIA request or whatever might confront an agency. And so, um, in light of that, as a driver, uh, e-discovery is one driver, and uh, frankly, uh, compliance with existing uh, policies is another driver, e even independent of litigation. The fact is, is that people are burdened by the volume of email and by other communications, and so they don't uh, always do the right thing, which is to uh, either print out or to uh, electronically archive on their own uh, if left to their own devices. They have other things to do um, during the day, which is to uh, you know, essentially carry out the mission of agencies. and so. Um, strategies that preceded Capstone were relying on backup tapes or relying on sort of idiosyncratic systems of capture in personal folders, uh, whether they're PSDs or otherwise. Um, and um, none of those strategies uh, work very well. Uh, Capstone is an idea to capture uh, emails to mitigate risk uh, so that um, an agency would have a body of emails from uh, senior officials and from everyone else for some period of time uh, where uh, the, uh, the agency has some level of assurance that uh, records of that agency are being preserved in an archive. And the difference that Capstone is that from prior policies is that it, it relies uh, on automated rules put into place uh, where senior officials' emails are considered presumptively permanent, subject to some exceptions, and everyone else's emails are considered presumptively temporary, uh, subject to uh, the ability to override in, in particular instances. Uh, I, I want to say, because I'm not sure I'm going to get a chance, 
uh, given uh, the level of expertise and everyone else on this call, is that Capstone is a um, is uh, absolutely an interim solution to a future uh, state uh, which implements really great software uh, that might exist in the marketplace. Open Text uh, is an example, uh, and it it is uh, incumbent on agencies to to uh, view Capstone as a kind of bridge. Uh, 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 where uh, the capture elements uh, under narrow policy are um, uh, somewhat simplistic and somewhat um, uh, large bucket in nature. So I think we, we can have a good discussion here of, of how um, capstone works as well as how even more sophisticated approaches to the management of email uh, might uh, be implemented. So, Jason, just quickly thinking about the Clinton story that broke this morning. <clears throat> you know, so how theoretically uh, should Capstone have been applied in in that case? Well, I would have expected that uh, any agency of uh, like the State Department, but not limited to that department, would expect of its high level officials not to solely use a private email account during their time in office. That comes as a surprise to many of us. Um, there are certainly understandable reasons to use private email accounts from time to time because of the exigencies of business. You're on a plane, you're moving from uh, point A to point B, you have a laptop, you have a smartphone, you right. can't be connected uh, to an official system. But the rules that are in place that are well understood are that um, high-level officials and, frankly, everyone else in government needs to use an official record-keeping system for email, and that it's the exception, not the rule, to use Gmail. The, the surprising element, the unusual element of the story that's breaking is that uh, the Secretary of State, uh, uh, Ms. Clinton, chose to uh, 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 only uh, use a private system for her communications, and that raises some eyebrows. and. Uh, and really doesn't represent good practice. If it was Capstone in place and she was had an account on the system, then all of her email records, those of historical importance and, and everything else that she created would be uh, captured in an archive for uh, uh, accessibility under FOIA and for preservation under the records laws. Right. So, so Mark, is Capstone being uh, applied by your, your customers and you know, how's it working? Um, well, what we've seen is because of the um, Managing Government Records Directives in the 2016 deadline, and also all of the uh, items that have hit the news that we all know about, um, there's a lot of focus on this at the highest level mm -hmm. of uh, all the agencies. <clears throat> and so what we've seen is that there's a groundswell of interest in implementing a system before the end of 2016. We've seen uh, quite a few requests for information and a few requests for proposals for solutions to meet this need. Uh, to our knowledge, the uh, Department of Interior is really the only agency that has already accomplished this on an enterprise scale for both the 2016 and 2019 objectives. I uh, wanted to ask the question of Jason. Uh, there's some brand new legislation that just got signed regarding uh, the National Archives and this specific issue about uh, official email usage. Um, can you brief the audience about that? Uh, sure. Uh, the Presidential and Federal Records Act amendments of 2014 were enacted in November 2014 and has a specific provision about personal email accounts. Uh, saying that uh, officials of agencies that, that uh, use personal email accounts um, need to transfer uh, email records to an official record keeping system within 20 days or they face some kind of disciplinary action if their um, uh, intentions, if they intentionally used a, a private email system uh, rather than inadvertently. And so that is a statutory requirement now, but um, I should quickly say that uh, long-standing narrow regulations uh, account for uh, the same kind of policy. That is, that it, under the expectation under the regs, uh, agencies 
uh, that allow individuals to use private email systems really should have put controls into place to ensure that that uh, uh, the occasional use of those uh, uh, private networks, uh, the records created on those were uh, transferred. So now it's a statutory requirement going forward. That did not apply to officials in the first uh, Obama administration. Right. Well, why don't we, uh, uh, thanks for that, guys. And So why don't we turn our attention to uh, an agency that has been tackling the email problem, the electronic records problem. And Carol, uh, it, as you mentioned, you're someone with deep experience in this space and have been helping to uh, the DOI <clears throat> navigate its way through this. So why don't you just share some of those experiences uh, with this agency trying to implement and get their arms around this and, and tell us what you've learned uh, about that so far. I'd love to talk to you about um, I can spend days doing it, but I'll try to consolidate <laughs> into just a few minutes. Perfect. Thank um, you. The DOI case study is repeatable. Um, it has a model that works very well for multiple agencies, and I see more and more people wanting to try this approach. Um, ERDMS is the Email Enterprise Records and Document Management System. And as you can see, um, Department of Interior is huge with multiple mandates. Um, it's a very large in terms of the number of employees and in the operating budget. Most of you probably don't know that it's responsible for a fifth of the land mass and produces a third of United States energy. It has bureaus like Bureau of Indian Affairs, Bureau of Land Management, um, Bureau of Reclamation, National Park Service, Fish and Wildlife Service. This is a mammoth organization, but to remove duplicata duplication and get control of their information assets, they decided to centralize all of this at the departmental level. They have met the M12-16-2016 deadlines and are well on their way to meeting the 2019 deadline. Um, but organizational size is really not the issue. We all face the same challenges access, retrieval, storage, and maintenance. Okay. Next slide, please. So um, DOI has fully embraced Capstone. We'd already set up our Capture by Position title before NARA came out with Capstone. We love Capstone. We are replacing all those position titles with names so that we can better manage the system. The issue is that people are not reading Capstone guidance with enough um, attention to detail. If you assign a three-year or seven-year retention to everything, you are at huge risk for your mission documentation. We do business by email. We cannot just have a general cutoff. The email must be associated with the tasks and functions and those records produced within the agency. And this year specifically, we're seeing all kinds of requests for proposals and requests for information that are asking for systems which only give three or seven year retentions. I'm thinking this is very short sighted on the uh, records manager's part because in three years you're going to have to manage everything. Email is just a media, it's not a particular record type. And we need to look at how this is going to affect the enterprise. Um, and not just for expediency. I'm thinking that this um, need for expediency is probably coming from upper level management that is not seeing the big picture, probably because they'll be gone by the time the 2019 deadline. <laughs> right. Okay, next slide please. So if you read email guidance, or if you read the NARA guidance, you'll see very clearly that record series is still a valid concept. And we need to retain that concept, whether you call it a record series or a big bucket. Like documents supporting a business purpose must be managed together. It doesn't matter if they're text or email, um, documents, slides, audiovisual, maps, they're all associated with a particular business process supporting a business decision. And for many of us, this is old hat, but we seem to have lost sight of this in our rush to meet the requirement. <clears throat> So I'm going to talk to you about the DOI strategy. Next slide, please. DOI formed work groups with all its bureau partners and created big bucket functional retention schedules. 
We did decide that the records of all the executive offices were permanent, but we decided to apply auto classification in addition so that we could capture the functional records and associate them with the schedule. And we are applying this retention um, assignment as records are created or as they're received into the agency. Not just three years or seven, but all of the existing retention periods. Go ahead. So we took all of the 200 schedules with 2,330 items and we parsed them and crosswalked them to the 37 lines of business that we were able to identify with just 189 retention periods. When you are receiving about 4 million emails a day, you've got to have simplified functional schedules that will capture the lines of business. We're finding that between 50 and 60 percent are duplicates. We are managing a single instance, but then stubbing to all of the other instances. Um, users are not allowed at all to access this journal email system we've built. It is held in the email archive, which is available only for investigations, congressional requests, audits, um, e-discovery, FOIA, and privacy requests. Next slide, please. So, Carol, there was, you're saying there was 200 separate retention schedules with 2,330 different retention periods across those 200 schedules? Wow. Yes, yeah, yeah, because it was spread over 14 bureaus. Right. The headquarters office. Right. And so much and duplication. that's fairly typical. Right. It is. That's fairly typical of the federal agency. Huh. So, so we had seven different bureaus working on fires with seven different approaches. And right. When, when we're sued, there's only one DOI. So you have to have a consistent approach to how you manage these records. So back to something else you said, Carol. You said you're finding about 50% duplication of email across the archive? We are. Wow. So single instance with stubbing, so you don't have to manage all of that. Yeah. Repeatedly. So, so that's a massive uh, volume reduction across, uh, across that system as well, right? It is, and we're also finding great quantities of um, the transitory records mm -hmm. and things that we call ultra-transitory, which are the systems pinging each other and saying, I'm awake and ready to do business with you. Right. So system-generated emails that are spit out. Right. right. Interesting. We hadn't even considered those when we started scoping, and, and we're calling those ultra-transitory. Ultra-transitory. I like that. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, to invent a label for it. <laughs> right. Sure. <clears throat> so, so tell us about the classification strategies you're using then. Okay. We're actually using four different types of classification and DOI to capture these records and assign appropriate retentions. And as your volume of material increases, automated tools become more and more necessary for consistent, accurate classification. Intelligent classification is the outside of that triangle. And it uses business rules to apply against every email received from every department. Auto classification is the exciting part, where you train your system to recognize kinds of business documents, supporting tasks which support functions, and that's how you get them into your system. But once your models are trained, you can turn them on. And other than doing quality control and enhancements, your model is done. No human effort is required. And then there are those tasks that um, are supported by structured workflow. And in those cases, we can see where the business um, record is created or received, and we can put the caption in there automatically without human intervention. Then the least desirable, of course, is the manual. It's most subject to inconsistencies. But there are still some materials that you're going to have to do manual classification for. Right. Hopefully fewer and fewer over time. Right. And those are our four strategies. Um, I'm, I'm just showing the retention periods um, kind of generally because everybody's always interested. We took those 37 functional categories and turned them into four really buckets, administrative, mission, policy, and legal. Um, administrative is all those housekeeping records that are common to every office in the entire world. Uh, mission um, are those records that reflect what you were um, chartered to perform. What is it? Why do you why do you exist? At the National uh, Park Service, for example, we have permanent that will never go to NARA. Um, this is true in most of our bureaus. We have 
records that will be the life of the Republic or the life of the Bureau that we aren't going to be able to transfer, so we'll need to be able to manage either with emulation or migration, computer um, museum. I don't know what we're going to do. Those right. kind of examples and policies. Um, policy is the highest level decision making, and legal includes uh, FOIA, congressional e discovery, um, investigations. So we take our 37 functional buckets and we put them into these four categories. It helps people conceptualize what they're doing and to apply the retention easily. So Carol, when you uh, talk about auto classification, um, can you provide just a little more detail about the criteria that are being used in auto classification? Is it just a sender, recipient, or is there is it a content based? Oh, no, no, no. No, it's doing semantic analysis of actual content. Okay. Um, for every um, one of these buckets I talk about, each one of them is composed of multiple functions, and each function has multiple tasks. And we are taking sample documents that represent that task and training the system to recognize that this is a particular kind of business document or a piece of correspondence. It has these like characteristics semantically analyzing every word in it and assigning a classification. So the model building process is very intensive. Mm -hmm. Right. Well, that, it, it uh, completely changes the scope of what records and information managers had done right. previously. Right, right. Yeah, that's fascinating. That, and that was a question asked by Brian Seward. Uh, on not, not my great question. That was his great question. So hopefully we answered oh. that. So what have, you, what have you learned through this process, Carol? Oh, um, continuous quality control and improvement and patience. We are two years into it. Um, it does take time to develop good models. And you want, you know, 75% accuracy and precision before you even turn them on, but 90% accuracy and precision before you start deleting with them. Because you have to have a legally dispensable program and a system you trust once you turn it on. Right. Well, excellent. I mean, and so how long have you been engaged there at the DOI? Two, just over two and a half years. Wow. You've accomplished a lot in two and a, in two and a half years. I, I, no, no, no. I'm just supporting them. They have this terrific group of records management professionals sure. and very closely aligned with IT, legal, and the program offices. It is very definitely a group effort. Right, right. Well, and that's the key, as you point out. I mean, it's this is not a project that any one person can uh, uh, take on. It requires real coordination amongst those various stakeholders in the in in the uh, in the problem, right? It, absolutely, it is a multi-year effort. And when I say document everything, it's because the players change continuously, and you don't want to have to resolve problem A that you've solved seven times already right. with other players. Right. Right. Interesting. And that's what I mean by documenting everything. Yeah. Well, one of the questions that just came in, uh, Carol, uh, from Krista is, uh, what's the tool that the DOI is using for auto classification? Um, we're using Open Text, the Records Management Module, the Content Management Module, and the Auto Classification Module. Okay. And this is all in the cloud. Right. And uh, another question from Jim was, how long does it take to train the system to do the auto classification? Oh boy, it's a continuous process yeah. for the records officers. Right. Um, initially getting it up um, three to six months, just collecting good quality exemplar documents is time consuming. Right. Um, you don't want 200 of the same documents. You want various documentation for how that task is performed and how all those tasks come together to become a function. Yeah. Well, I think it's just, I mean, you made a, a great point earlier, and this is something that I've been sort of telling this community as well, is this is a classic example of how the role of the records manager is changing, right? I mean, did, it, did any records manager imagine, you know, even five years ago that a big part of their job would be, you know, training this machine, this system to to do this kind of work? But as you say, it's a very specialized uh, task that requires people with that kind of expertise, I think. Well, in Berkeley, in addition to that, they really have to lead, their, real, their role has evolved to information governance. They have to lead and they have to work with the operations staff right. to really buy out that documentation. They really have to know their business inside and out. Well, let's talk, well, thanks so much for that, Carol. I think it's, 
it's, it's so useful in these discussions to hear from somebody who is actually, you know, doing it. And, you know, there, there's a lot of, you know, high level conversation about information governance and particularly auto classification. And it's, it's great to see it uh, in use. I guess, Jason, I wanted to turn to you um, briefly and just get your sense on, you know, s since you envisioned Capstone originally, uh, you know, what, what do you kind of see as its, its, its strengths and weaknesses um, and what we can learn from it as we, as we turn our attention to organizations outside of the federal government? Yes, it's, uh, I think it's a vast improvement on um, the prior policies that relied on a compliance level that people are just unwilling to do, whether it's print paper or drag and drop. And so archiving email with presumptive rules um, is a good thing. It is a very broad brush type policy. Uh, everyone involved in developing Capstone knows that while senior officials create lots of interesting and important uh, email records and attachments to those email, they, they also create other uh, short-term records that are swept up, and so it's imprecise. It's also um, the way that agencies can implement Capstone is for everyone else who's not at the senior level. Um, uh, having a default uh, records uh, retention period of three or seven or ten years or whatever uh, an agency sets uh, is uh, also a broad brush where there uh, may well be a need for uh, some of those email records to be retained longer. Uh, but the, the good news is that when an agency adopts a capstone policy, I believe the National Archives will still be going forward with a general record schedule that will set some sort of minimum retention uh, for uh, the emails of everyone so that the senior officials are permanent and everybody else's is uh, some period of years. Now, I applaud uh, what uh, Carol and what OpenText are, are doing um, at the Department of Interior, uh, uh, attempting to do a, uh, a more sophisticated look at uh, classifying records using advanced analytics and auto classification is the wave of the future. NARA recognizes this in policy guidance that they put out in September 2014 associated with an automated records management plan. Um, they've recognized it in other guidance that, that uh, the future is one of um, software being able to auto classify. But Capstone was an attempt at doing something rather than uh, continuing to rely on the failed policies of the past. Yeah. Well, that's, you know, you know, one of the, one of the things in, you know, you and I have had several conversations about this, Jason, is that, you know, in some ways at, at the simplest level, Capstone is saying like, look, do something better than, you know, what, what you've been trying to do or, or not trying to do at all. And I think that that's a really good message for all organizations is that, look, it's, you know, when you're tackling this problem, you know, so many organizations are really immature and, and taking this kind of pragmatic approach that moves you along the, the scale of maturity is, is I think smart business, but so let's, so let's turn our attention to that. So if capstone is, is a kind of a pragmatic and, and uh, uh, approach that can be applied really without uh, too much uh, work or, or even necessarily buying anything extra to make it happen, let's talk about what organizations who are, are, are who have moved past that are doing and what's possible to um, to do when it comes to email governance. Now, um, Greg, I know that we've talked about this concept of Capstone Plus and how how um, some of your customers are, are kind of using Capstone as a starting point, but then building out from that with some more sophisticated uh, techniques. Can you just take us through that? Uh, Mark, did you want to start, and then I'll uh, I can jump in at the end. Okay. Well. Um, as Jason mentioned, you know, Capstone is a starting point, and it's better than what preceded it. Um, but it's also not the end point, and it has a number of weaknesses that um, kind of stand out to us. Uh, one of those is that uh, for just the Capstone accounts, um, saving all of their email permanently um, is a, a big problem. So there's plenty of transitory material, non-record material, in those capstone accounts. 
And so by applying auto classification to uh, the capstone accounts, we are able to um, purge the transitory material and therefore save quite a bit less email related to those people as before. The other part of it is that uh, for all of the remaining temporary accounts, as Carol mentioned, uh, the best practice is to apply the agency's overall retention rules to that email and not to have specific rules just for email. And, and that's one of the maxims of records management. You're supposed to have a functional retention schedule that is media neutral. That was originally created during the time we were moving from paper to electronic documents. And the idea that uh, we didn't want to have a record schedule is different for paper and different from electronic documents. Now we apply the same concept to email, as email is just another format. Um, so as, as Carol mentioned, we have CAD files and maps and Word documents, Excel spreadsheets and instant messages, and all of that media needs to uh, be governed by a common policy. So this Capstone Plus idea applies auto classification and a big bucket schedule to all of the content, not just email, in a very consistent way that both meets the uh, deadline of 2016 as well as 2019. Greg? Well, then I think a couple things. If we look at Capstone Plus, both from a um, public and private sector perspective, the, the, the thing that's you know, ubiquitous about Capstone is a pragmatic approach, right, which is regardless of the market you're in, right, if, if you're taking a pragmatic approach to managing email, managing, you know, broader broader content sources and taking a holistic view of, of, of your content, it, email's a really great place to start, right. Um, and from an auto classification perspective, again, we talked about the shortcomings of, of end users and, and, and classification and, and the manual nature kind of throughout this, this presentation. But if you've got a system that is using exemplar documents that represent policies that a records manager within your organization has 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 set up, it's it's self-tuning, it's not relying on algorithms and, and, and a black box, you know, you're really setting, you know, the system up to, you know, improve over time. And, and like Carol said, the, the goal is to, you know, further reduce that, that manual nature in terms of, of classification, have the system self-learn over time. So we're seeing that both, you know, like Mark has said, in, in, in the public sector, but also in the private sector, you know, across across industries. We you know, we still have customers that want to have users interacting and, and, and managing email uh, and, and classifying it on their own, but what we're seeing is a really strong uptick in terms of uh, people interested in auto classification and how it can be implemented, you know, in, in conjunction with um, end users classifying email, but a, a lot are really striving towards, you know, they're moving to Office 365, they're moving to Gmail. H how do I, you know, get a handle in terms of, of, of broadly governing, you know, these, you know, cloud-based uh, productivity tools? So at the end of the day, you know, it's, I think Capstone's a great approach because it's pragmatic. Um, and whether you're in private or public sector, right, just just starting with, with emails is, is a really good uh, foot forward in terms of information governance and looking at how it can apply both departmentally across it but also across the organization. So Greg, one of the questions that just came in from Kevin is, uh, and maybe you can't answer this off the top of your head, if not we can deal with it offline, but uh, can you tell us about the cloud supplier and FISMA certification level? Does the DOI have any FISMA high level info and how do you deal with it? So maybe that's a question for both you and, and Carol. But. Pro probably more towards Carol because the, the, in, in specifically to the DOI, um, we're, we're leveraging the uh, IQ Business Group uh, cloud. I can talk specifically afterwards if, if, if you want um, about open text, but I'll, I'll let Carol talk specifically to DOI. We do have a FISMA moderate cloud. Um, you know, it's um, met the requirements. It's certified. We continuously upgrade, review, and evaluate that. Right. Okay. Well, great. And I'd be glad to uh, provide additional information afterward as well. Sure. Perfect. Uh, another question that came in from Rick was, and I think this is for you, Carol, um, did you consider the effect effectiveness of using 
user ID functional descriptors as opposed to content semantics as perhaps a shorthand or interim big bucket strategy to link emails to schedules or policies based on functions? Um, we did consider that briefly. We had already decided that we were going to try out a classification because that was the client's preference. Right. Interesting. So that's the route we went. Yeah. And we are we will supplement it with all kinds of business rules and are supplementing it already. Yeah, yeah. Right. Barkley, would you would you see that strategy though of using um A D groups or, or you know, a real risk of, of over retention? I think, you know, when you're journaling, when you're taking a legal copy of everything, uh well that might make your legal searches complete, um, but <laughs> I, I think there's a risk of over retention. Well, right? plus, if you can supplement plus nobody it has an Active Directory that actually works, right? So, <laughs> you know, Touché. it's kind of a fantasy in the first place. <laughs> um, all right, well, let's talk a little bit about you know um, this maturity model for email governance. That um, sorry, did I just change that slide to the last slide? Yeah, could you go back a few? <laughs> so Ghost is controlling the slides. There we go. So yeah, so let's talk about um, this maturity more, model for email more governance more. in the cloud, which I think is actually quite useful and a practical um, you know, guide for people uh, approaching this. So do you want to walk us through this, Mark? Uh, yes. Um, so I've been working on this issue with my customers and also uh, from the standpoint of uh, my own work within uh, DC government uh, for quite some time. And what I find is that it makes the conversation a lot clearer if you define who the stakeholders are because the, um, the solution uh, is different for each stakeholder. Um, Barkley, I think we have some automated slide as going on. <laughs> we seem to. <laughs> you go back to slide 19. Uh, to back. Oh. That's me. it. That's oh, a hint. That's a hint, Mark. We have we have seven minutes left. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. So uh, <laughs> many of the types of email solutions you're familiar with are strictly supporting the IT stakeholder. And so their objectives are to optimize the uh, production email system, you know, consolidate email systems, lowering operational storage costs. And uh, you have certain uh, email archiving products that support IT's needs. Um, however, when you look at the legal community uh, for e-discovery and FOIA, uh, congressional inquiries, audits, uh, the requirements are very different and the solutions are very different. Uh, you heard the term journaling. Uh, journaling is an approach that saves all of the email coming and going uh, into a separate archive. And that's the approach we use at Department of the Interior um, with all the classification. And um, it, it's separate from the production email system. So that's really important. Um, with the legal community, you have some concerns such as foliation chain of custody, uh, you know, the idea that an end user could potentially delete their own email um, that may be subject to a court case later on uh, is, is very critical. Um, capstone um, it is important to records managers and legal, uh, but the stakeholder for permanent retention are the archivists. So historians, biographers, and, and so on. And the most overlooked uh, category of stakeholder is the business. As Carol mentioned, that uh, the most important use of email uh, is to support the mission and the ability to save those emails uh, in the context of business transactions is very important. The next slide. So we have uh, uh, three levels of maturity. So level one is just the IT solution. It's um, either on premise or in the cloud, but it, it does not have any records management. And some agencies have taken that approach 
and they're now realizing that it doesn't meet the needs of the 2016 requirements or the needs of legal uh, historians and so on for the business. Uh, a level two, next slide, is uh, email in the cloud with an email archive and records management, but it's not part of a larger enterprise content management solution. And again, many agencies have taken this approach. They're just focusing on email. And the key is that they are not addressing the mission. Uh, there's no ability to save those emails in the context of the business transaction. Next slide. Uh, level three is the highest level of maturity. Um, and this is what DOI is doing. And so it's um, a solution that meets the needs of all stakeholders. It's email in the cloud with integrated records management email journaling, auto classification, and content management. And that's the only approach that meets the needs of all the stakeholders, and this is what's going to be needed for the 2019 uh, deadline. Uh, next slide. Just to illustrate this, uh, the Capstone Plus idea uh, uses role-based classification. This can be an active directory group or another type of uh, directory services grouping. Um, and we apply a two-bucket approach to Capstone uh, so that we can weed out the transitory and non-record material using the auto-classification engine. Uh, for the vast majority of the temporary emails, we again apply auto-classification um, to identify transitory, to weed that out and also to classify the rest of the email according to your agency big bucket record schedule and not an arbitrary three or seven year rule. And then in the middle there, the business records, those are the ones that need to be stored in the ECM repository, uh, either through process automation, as Carol mentioned, you know, workflow, uh, business process, um, free engineering. Um, and, and some manual classification, but basically you're storing those emails in the context of the case file, uh, project folder, and so on. Back to you. Excellent. Thanks, Mark. That, <clears throat> I think that's a great uh, maturity model for organizations to take and, and think through as they kind of plot their strategy and, and look at where they are at and, and where they think that they can actually go uh, you know, culturally, that's often you know the biggest challenge, and I'm sure you've you've seen that with your your clients as well, uh, Mark. In the last few minutes that we have here, um, I wanted to just share some additional information. Carol had provided us with some contact information for the uh, uh, folks who are, are driving this project at the Department of Interior. So for other agencies uh, working on capstone and electronic records projects, uh, those will be good contacts for you to reach out to. Um, you probably won't have a chance to transcribe them, of course, right now, but you'll you'll get a link to this recording uh, uh, quite soon after our live event today. Um, as I mentioned, uh, the topics that we talked about today are discussed in detail. Uh, the history of Capstone, the background, Capstone Plus uh, approaches to uh, using auto classification uh, for email are uh, discussed in the paper. You'll get a download link for that. Um, if you're registered for the webinar. Uh, here's contact information for us. Uh, reach out to any of us if you have questions about uh, information governance, about email management. Uh, specifically, uh, Ms. Carol mentioned she's got some, some real great insight, I think, uh, into how agencies are tackling this, and, and uh, I'm sure we'd be happy to share it. Uh, last couple of things. Um, <clears throat> go to the OpenTax website uh, for uh, details on the products. Uh, that are being used at the DOI, uh, as Carol shared with us, and also join uh, our community at the IGI. It's a, a great place to uh, discuss issues like this with your peers and to get uh, insight into what other people are doing. We just hear again and again in that uh, community that that's the most valuable thing we provide is just a chance to talk to peers and and learn what um, what people are doing uh, in organizations like yours. So um, I hit those links up. In our, what, any final thoughts uh, from you, Jason, um, as you prepare to go? Uh, are you going to talk to Anderson Cooper uh, today? Uh, it seems that the media has descended. Uh, 
uh, on uh, on at least somebody who wants to uh, talk on the record. So uh, the answer is yes. The uh, this discussion has been terrific. Um, Open text and others are, are, are leading the way um, uh, to uh, a path towards uh, meeting the goals of the government in 2016 and ultimately the digital mandate in 2019. And and uh, those individuals who are listening to this uh, in the federal uh, record keeping sector um, have hope that there are um, really good uh, industry solution providers out there who can assist uh, agencies. And so I'm hoping that this webinar jump starts a conversation in dozens of places throughout the federal government and also is eye opening for um, individuals in the private sector who may also want to adopt capstone like uh, solutions. So I applaud Open Text and uh, and I'm very glad, Barclay, that the IGI has uh, been sponsoring this webinar. Great. Well, thanks, Jason. I wanted to thank uh, Carol and, and Greg and Mark as well. Uh, uh, great guests today, as I said at the beginning, really providing, I think, some practical insight into how organizations are handling this and, and some of the technology behind that. A great maturity model uh, from Mark that I think is really useful. So I also wanted to thank OpenText for supporting this webinar. OpenText is a charter supporter of the Information Governance Initiative, which means that they supported uh, our activities when it was nothing more than a, a promise. So we're very grateful for that. And, and uh, so go look at what they're up to. All right, well, thanks everyone. As I said, um, you'll receive a, a link to uh, the, the uh, white paper as well as the recording of this webinar shortly. So uh, good luck out there today. Thank you. <laughs>